the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are so thankful tonight to be blood washed, to be blood bought. Father, we're so thankful that when we were lost, when we were separated from you by sin, that you sent Jesus to this earth. Lord, he was destined to do that before the world was founded. Lord, before humanity ever had a problem, God, you already had your solution in store. And we're so thankful for Jesus tonight. We honor the love, Father, that you've shown to us in sending Jesus Christ to the earth to shed his blood, to die on the cross, to be raised from the dead, and to give to us as an absolute free gift the gift of eternal life, to make us your children, to cleanse us, to make us righteous. Lord, just to to give us right standing in your family. We're so thankful, Father, to, to receive everything that you've given for us. And tonight, Father, we're thankful for the Holy Spirit who's come to teach us and to guide us and to to reveal to our hearts and our minds the holy written Word of God. Father, that we can know you more so that we can love you and receive your love more effectively. And Lord, so that we can be the light in the earth that you need us to be. Father, we thank you now for teaching us by the Spirit of God and giving us insight to your holy, precious, written word. And we'll be careful to give you all the glory, all the praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Well, I want to talk to you tonight about, uh, if we're going to give tonight a title, I would call this tonight Ruin and Restoration. Ruin and Restoration. How many of you have known some ruin in your life? How many of you have seen some death, some decay, some destruction? You know, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And we all have different backgrounds. We all have different experiences. Different ones have, you know, gone deep into some things. And, and man, they just realized that they were uh, headed in a direction that if they didn't get turned around, you know, they were never going to come back. Other people may have lived, you know, a little bit more shielded lives, more protected lives. But maybe you've seen it in other people's lives. You've seen the death and the destruction and different things that, you know, this world can just deal a lot of really harsh, harsh blows. And, uh, but as much as there is ruin in the world, uh, there is restoration in the world. And, and that's why it's so great to be able to come to a place like this where, where there's hope, you know, I was just sitting here thinking about when, when all that... You know, I grew up Presbyterian. You know, you know what that means? That means we didn't do that. <laughs> and I was just thinking, you know, we were very solemn. We were very ritualistic and that type of thing. And, and please, I'm not... Don't, if, if, if that's your background too, I'm not, you know, I'm not being negative. I'm just saying there's different styles and different things like that. And, uh, but I was just thinking, what you know, somebody that didn't know God... Somebody that didn't understand that, that joy that Pastor Jim was talking about, you know, trying to figure this stuff out. What are people doing? Well, you know, even if somebody didn't understand what was going on, even if they don't know anything about God, anything about the Bible, anything about faith, you, you'd have to look at that and say, I may not understand that, but I sure wish I was as happy as they were. I sure wish I was as carefree and, and as joyful as they were. You know, there, there's restoration in the world because there is a God who has refused to leave us alone. There's a God who's refused to leave us to our own devices. And even when we've messed up royally, He loves us anyway. You know, our, our human ancestry is uh, pretty good at making excuses. Instead of just fessing up and saying, you know, I've messed things up, I've, I've made wrong decisions. You know, we, in human history, there's just such a history of wanting to blame everybody else. You know, Adam and Eve, you know, when they were here and God gave Adam these very specific directions and, and, and when they just totally had messed up, God came to Adam in the garden 
And isn't it good that God came? Even when they totally disobeyed Him, He still came for them. He still came to them. Loved them enough not to just, you know, abandon them. He, he came to them. And He came with this simple question, Adam, where are you? And God's still asking that question today, where are you? And, and when Adam finally came out from behind the bushes where he was hiding, and I, I liked... Uh, Dan, your comments about the fig briefs and the fig shirts and, and all that. When Adam finally came out from, you know, the shame and the guilt, you know, that, that he was dealing with, and God said, Adam, have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you not to eat? You know what he said? He said, the woman you gave me. The woman. A simple yes would have worked. But no, Adam had to say it was the woman that you gave me. If it wasn't for her and you, I would, I'm clear here. <laughs> and you know, a, a few, you know, millennium later, uh, Moses goes up on the mountain spending time with God and Aaron, his brother, you know, the associate pastor, so to speak, I like what a friend of mine says. He says, while Moses is up with God, Aaron throws the biggest frat party that had ever occurred on the face of the earth. And Moses comes down from the mountain. He's been up there for 40 days and nights. And, and, and I mean, the, he is a hundred watts full of the glory of God. And, and he comes down to this party that just debauchery and worshiping false idols and who knows what was going on, but it was not good. And he goes straight from, from the, the pinnacle of, of a divine glory uh, to, to being confronted face to face with sin and debauchery and Moses' face is radiating with glory. And, and he looks at Aaron and says, Aaron, what is this that you have done? And Aaron, who had sculpted the golden calf, said, Oh, Moses, don't get upset. You know how these people are. They're inclined to mischief. He said, they, they wanted, I just put the gold in the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> See, God is a God of truth. And, and God doesn't play games. I read somewhere on a bumper sticker recently, something about quit messing around with God. Did I read that somewhere? God doesn't want us to mess with Him. He wants us to be honest with Him. But, but in our human ancestry and in our human culture, nobody wants to take responsibility for anything. Nobody wants to take ownership of anything. Let me give you some, some good reasons. This is, you know, why bother being a responsible adult? when you can give excuses. For example, my inner child made me do it. I missed my nap time. This candy bar is just to give me the energy to exercise. I haven't been the same since Elvis died. I was having an OBE out of brain experience. There was a full moon, or at least a pretty full moon. You're thinking in black and white. Think in shades of gray. These are all things that you can, you know, excuses that you can use instead of acknowledging something. How about this one? My convergence wasn't harmonized. If you're from the hippie era, you will understand that. How about this? This is another excuse. I learned the wrong seven habits. <laughs> when you've messed up and somebody's calling you to, you know, account for messing up, minimize it. Say, you call this a problem? The Titanic, that was a problem. <laughs> you know, but people a lot of times, they just don't want to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I messed up, I missed it. They won't fess up and won't uh, make up. Uh, insurance companies have kept track of some of the things that have been written down on some insurance forms about accidents. 
One person wrote on an accident report form for their insurance company, coming home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree that I don't have. <laughs> Another person wrote, as I approached the intersection, a stop sign suddenly appeared in a place where no stop sign had ever appeared before. I was unable to stop in time to avoid the accident. Another person on an insurance form wrote, my car was legally parked as it backed into the other vehicle. <laughs> Another said, an invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my vehicle and vanished. I love this one. The telephone pole was approaching fast. I attempted to swerve out of its way when it struck my front end. The woman you gave me. <laughs> we just love, we, we just, there's something about the flesh, the carnal nature that just doesn't, you know, shame or condemnate. We just don't want to say, but you know one of the most liberating things in the world is just to be able to stand before God and say, God, you know what? I need your mercy. Without your mercy, I've sinned. I've come short of your glory. There's two things that are at work in the world. One is ruin and one is restoration. Jesus said this in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. If you just want to put this in the column of your Bible or somewhere, just write the word ruin. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. There are forces at work in this world that are just simply there to rip you off. And so many of the time, so much of the time, what Satan brings never advertises the, the long-term result. He'll show people the short-range pleasure of sin, but he won't show people the long-range sorrow. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Everybody say, ruin. ruin. And then Jesus said, but I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Restoration. Two forces at work in the earth today, ruin and restoration. And just getting honest with God is one of the quickest ways to get off the, the path of ruin and to get on the path of restoration. You know, sometimes I think even we're too quick to blame everything on the devil. I believe there are evil spiritual forces in the world. I believe what the Bible says about, you know, an angel, Lucifer, who tried to exalt himself above the throne of God, who was kicked out of heaven. You know, the Bible teaches that there are demonic spiritual forces on, in the earth today that are operating to blind the, the minds of men so that they don't see the truth of the gospel. You know, the Bible talks about the tempter, the, the temptations of the world. I, I totally believe in, in spiritual forces in this earth that are malevolent toward man. But they're not greater than the Spirit of God. And, and, and one thing about it is this, the devil is not omnipotent. The devil is not omnipresent. And the devil is not omniscient. He's not all-powerful. He's not everywhere. He's not all-knowing. He is an angelic being. He is limited in his scope and operation. And I don't want to give him more credit or glory than I don't want to give him any glory, but I, but I don't want to magnify him in any way, shape, or form. And sometimes I just think it's a cop-out for Christians just to blame everything on the devil. I remember one time many years ago, a man said, yeah, Brother Cook, the, the devil's really attacking my marriage. Well, I knew a little bit about how he was treating his wife. And if the devil was attacking his marriage, it was because he, the husband, was giving the devil all the ammunition. I understand there are evil spiritual forces in the world, but I also understand that we are free moral agents and that the devil's not responsible for everything that happens. Sometimes... We do it to ourselves. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy. 
you know, yeah, there is a thief that comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. And there is Jesus who comes to give us life and life more abundantly. But if you go back in the book of Proverbs, you find there's two competing influences trying to establish influence in the hearts of men and women. And it's foolishness and wisdom. And when we yield to foolishness, when we yield to disobedience, to rebellion, to doing life and conducting ourselves contrary to the, to the known will of God, then we, we put ourselves on that path of ruin and we do more damage to ourselves than the devil does. And when we set ourselves in the path of wisdom and determine in our heart that with the help of the Holy Spirit... And with the influence and the light of the Word of God, we're going to believe what God tells us to believe and think how God tells us to think and live how God tells us to live and re relate to others the way God tells us to relate to others. We put ourselves in the, in the path of wisdom and the, the path of wisdom results in, in life. Much of our ruin... In life, and I say this not, not wanting to project any condemnation, but, but just we just need to be honest about it. Much of our ruin in life is self inflicted. And much of our restoration requires our cooperation with God. Now, can we say that truthfully? without projecting any kind of condemnation. We're not here to beat anybody over the head for past mistakes. That's why we're here, because God is a God of new beginnings. His mercies fail not. He gives us opportunities to start again, cleansed and washed and pure by the blood of Jesus. But we can't step into the path of restoration if we're not acknowledging when it is the case that we are the ones that need to make a decision and turn to God and turn to God's way and not simply blame everyone else. Hosea chapter 13 verse 9, amazing verse. In the King James, Hosea 13, 9, God said, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thy help. Even when you were against yourself, even when you were sabotaging yourself, even when you were uh, undermining your, your future, your success, even when you were doing things contrary to your own best interests, God was still there and is still there looking to pull you in the right direction. And even though, uh, you know, you and I have made mistakes in our own past that have sabotaged our own path. God says, you've messed up, but I'm still your help. I'm for you. I am not against you. Sometimes we tend to resist God the hardest when we need Him the most. Another great verse, Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Do you know that when we confess our sins is not when God finds out about them? We don't do that for his benefit like, oh, really? I didn't know you did that. Really? We, we don't do that. We don't do it to wallow in it. We don't do it to dwell in the past. What we do is we do it to face up to the truth, and then move forward. Because he makes it very plain, very clear to us that, that if we confess those things to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and, and his mercies are new every morning. A man, I love what one individual said, he said, a man can fail many times, but he isn't a failure until he begins to blame somebody else. Let me tell you two, two all-important questions that every one of us has to answer in our life. Number one, we have to answer the question. We may never consciously go over these questions, but everybody is living out these questions. But we need to consciously know what they are and then make the right decision. Number one, this question. What am I going to allow to influence my life? 
What am I going to allow to influence my life? You have to make that decision. Are you going to let the mentality of the world be the predominant influence of your life? Are you going to let the messages coming out of Hollywood? Are you going to let... uh, I mean, we could just... You know, the Bible says in the last days there will be perilous times. People will be lovers of self rather than lovers of God, lovers of pleasure. Now, what is it that's going to determine our values? What is it that's going to determine our priorities? How, what, what's going to determine how am I going to treat my wife? How am I going to treat my children? What influence? Where am I going to learn that stuff? You know, maybe we had good role models at home. Maybe we didn't have good role models at home. Maybe we didn't have any role models at home. But, but what's going to be... What's going to be the governing influence of our life? You know, Jesus said, there's two great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Show me a person who has made a rock-solid decision that I will live for the commandment of God. Not only the great commandment, but I'll live for the great commission. I'll show you a person who their life begins to come under different influences. Their life begins to be influenced by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, by the wisdom of God, by the love of God. Whatever you allow your life to be influenced by will will affect your, your spiritual and emotional DNA. What is going to be the influence of your life? See, all of us have the potential to let past junk be the influence of our life. Somebody told you you'll never amount to anything. Somebody told you that, you know, uh, life is terrible. Just go for the gusto. Just get what you can get while the getting's good. Is that what's going to influence your life? Some of us have had experiences of abuse and abandonment. And so we've learned that life is all about protecting ourselves and hurt somebody else before they can hurt you. Build up walls and live behind walls forever. Maybe we've had unhealthy, dysfunctional relationships that have have ripped us to the core of our being. But is that going to be the the main influence of our life? Is the ruin going to determine who we are? The first question we have to ask is, what's going to be the influence in my life? And secondly, what am I going to take ownership of? Now, you may have been influenced by some things, but you don't have to take ownership of them. Maybe somebody ripped you off. Maybe somebody betrayed you terribly. And you felt all the normal emotions of of shock and rage and anger and mistrust and all the different things that go with it, but, but you, you can't change history of what happened to you, but do you really want to take ownership of that and let that be what really governs your life? Do you want to carry the poison of that? Do you want to carry the pain of that for the rest of your life? What is it that you're going to allow to influence your life and what is it that you're going to take ownership of? Do you want to be the person that the garbage of the world, the pain of the world, the the, uh, instability of the world, the uncertainty of the world forms you into a person? Or do you want to let the love of God make you the person that God wants you to be? You, You can't change what's happened to you historically. But you can make a decision about what you're going to take with you on the rest of the journey. I want you to look at a verse. This is a a verse I just came across a month or so ago in the message version. 2 Corinthians 6, 11. Paul was having a hard time. I heard Pastor Deborah teaching about how the Corinthians were getting drunk at communion. And... um, you know, to even amplify on that, they weren't just getting drunk at communion, but they were suing each other. 
in court. Paul called them babies. Said, you're a bunch of spiritual babies. You're carnal. Um, they just, uh, the Corinthian church was a mess. Paul loved them so much, but there came a point in time where the Corinthian church got upset with Paul and they basically were under an influence to not accept the word of God that Paul was preaching. And in a moment of, it was real frustration, Paul said this to them, 2 Corinthians 6, 11. He said, dear, dear Corinthians, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open spacious life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can. Now, another way of that is no bull. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. D does that impact you the way that impacts me? Because all of us, we can live big to the world and small to God. Or we can live big to, the, big to God and small to the world. I put it another way. You can be Velcro or you can be Teflon. As a matter of fact, let me put it this way. You are Velcro and you are Teflon. Because something is sticking to you and something is sliding off of you. It just is an issue of what are you Velcro to and what are you Teflon to. You know what Teflon is? Teflon's that stuff they spray on the cooking pan so stuff doesn't stick. Let me tell you what Satan's plan is for your life. Satan's plan is for when it comes to the world and the junk and the garbage and the attitudes and the, the behaviors of the world, Satan wants you to be Velcro. He wants it to stick to you. He wants every hurt, every offense, every bitterness, every bit of unforgiveness, every bit of... He wants you to be Velcro to all that, just have all that. And when it comes to the things of God, he wants you to be Teflon. He just wants it to all slide off of you. You want to know what God's plan is for your life? God's plan for your life is this. When it comes to Him... And all the things he has for you, he wants you to be Velcro. It all sticks. When it comes to the, the things of the world, he wants you to be Teflon. Just have that stuff slide off. But you're going to have to decide. The Corinthians had gotten themselves in a place where they had gotten their, their attitudes were out of joint. They, they were torqued. They, they, were, they didn't trust Paul anymore. They, and I, we don't want to go the way Paul's telling us to go. And Paul said this. He said, the smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. When we get out of sorts, when we get out of fellowship with God, when we decide we're not going to listen to the Word of God, when we decide that you know, we're not going to avail ourselves to the worship and the praise of God, and, and I'm not just talking about going through the motions, but I'm talking about with all of your heart. You open your heart to God and say, God, I am yours. I am not my own. I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. I, I'm a citizen of heaven. And God, I want everything that you have, everything of your spirit, everything of your word, everything of the fruit of the spirit, everything of the gifts of the spirit, I want everything you have, Father, to, to, uh, to flood into my life. I want to live big God in you. And I want her to live really small when it comes to the world.
Paul was begging the Christians to set their heart in that direction. But we have to make decisions. We have to take action. We have to make decisions. I'm going to quit blaming people. I'm going to quit blaming circumstances. Stuff has happened historically, but you still hold the key to your future. God said, I set before you life and death. Blessing and cursing, choose life. Nobody can take that away from you. A lady, Eleanor Smith, said, people of accomplishment rarely sat back and let things happen to them. They went out and happened to things. You know, one of the, one of the greatest stories of the Bible, in my view, is the story of Joseph. Because never did, a, did an individual experience so much junk and have so much hurt thrown his way. He was betrayed by his older brothers and sold into slavery. They thought about killing him, and he knew that. They decided to sell him into slavery instead. Isn't, isn't that nice and comforting? He ended up a slave in a foreign land. He was lied about by his employer's wife, his boss's wife, and thrown into prison. He was forgotten about by an individual who promised that he would help him get out of jail and that individual that he had helped promptly forgot about him. I mean, if anybody had known abuse, abandonment, rejection, if anyone had reason to be full of bitterness and cynical about life, it was Joseph. But I love what Genesis 39, 20 says. It says, then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Here's the thing about Joseph. He was in the prison, but he never let the prison get in him. He had that choice. He could live, with, he could live just stewing and thinking about all the people that had done him wrong, or he could think about the one who would do him right. And he made a choice. He made a choice to live in the favor and in the mercy of God. And some people just, what they've done, what they've said has been so damaging, it's created such a source of pain. But you don't have to take ownership of the pain. You can't change what they said. You may not even be able to change the fact that it stirred you up, made you angry. I mean, hey, it's normal to have some, some, some reactions and feelings and, and things like that. I'm not trying to turn you into a robot. But, but after you've dealt with some of the emotions and all that, then you need to ask, do I want to own this? Do I want to carry this with me the rest of my life? Do I want to carry this around as baggage in my life? And let me tell you one of the greatest things you can ever decide when you've been messed with by life, when people have done you wrong, is embrace this truth. What they did was a reflection of who they are. It's not a reflection of who I am. What they said is a reflection of who they are. It's not a reflection of who I am. And I want to show you something really fascinating about Joseph and, and how he handled this and what is it that caused him to move into the right direction and end up one of the most blessed men in all the Word of God. In Genesis chapter 41, we see something in verse 50 about Joseph and, and after he was through all these trials and tribulations and all, it says, "...and to Joseph were born two sons." Verse 51, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God has made me to forget all my toil in my father's house. That's what the name Manasseh means, to forget. And the name of the second he called Ephraim. 
For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. His two sons, he named them Manasseh, which means to forget. And his second born, Ephraim, which means to be fruitful. I think there's some significance in that. Let me just say it this way. You will never become fruitful until you have learned how to forget. He named them in that order for a reason. You will never be fruitful until you have learned how to forget. See, we're talking tonight, we're talking about not making excuses. We're talking about what influence we're going to let uh, prevail in our life, what we're going to take ownership of. And Joseph had to come to the determination, I was sold into slavery, but that's not because that's who I am. That was who my brothers were. I was lied about, but that's not about who I am. That's about who Potiphar's wife was. I was forgotten, but that's not about who I am. That's about what that individual, those were their issues. I refuse to let them be my issues for the rest of my life. Because I'm not going to let somebody else's hang-ups and sin uh, become a ball and chain for me to drag around the rest of my life. I'm not going to allow somebody else's bad decisions to mess up my future destiny. Said, but I can't forget, I can't forget, I can't forget. Well, let's, let's talk about what it means to forget. Let me tell you some things that forgetting is not. Forgetting is not amnesia. It's not absent-mindedness. It's not a denial of the facts. It's not suppression. It's not ignoring reality. Here's what forgetting is. Forgetting is a process whereby the former events lose their power to control your present or dominate your future. Forgetting does not erase history, but it eliminates the past being the predominant factor in your life. Let me just say that to you again. Forgetting is the process whereby former events lose their power to control your present or dominate your future. Forgetting does not erase history, but it eliminates the past being the predominant factor in your life. In other words, you don't forget in the absolute sense of no mental recall whatsoever, but even though that information is there as a historical fact, it's no longer the governing, empowering, dominating force or influence in your life. Historically, you know it happened. But redemptively, God has done something in your life that is so much bigger than that that God's favor and God's mercy just causes you to look back on that thing and say, yeah, it happened, but it, it's not the, it's not, wh why would I focus on that when I can focus on this? That was ruin. This is restoration. This was the garbage and the junk of the ruin of sin, but these are the blessings of the favor of God that I have now that I'm a blood-washed, blood-bought child of God. There are always two sets of laws at work. There's something in life that's always going to be against you. Gravity is against you. There's all kinds of natural things in life that are against you. But there's always someone who's for you. What are you going to focus on? What's going to be the object of your attention? Satan is against you. God is for you. Where do you want to put your focus? 
Let me give you a phrase here. The higher law will always lead to the higher life. The higher law will always lead to the higher life. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. You can live your life reacting to every junk thing that happens. You can live your life irritated by people. You can live your life disappointed with circumstances. You can live your life, you know, uh, uh, bemoaning, you know, things of the past. Or you can believe that we serve a God who restores and that He has favor for you. He has mercy for you. He has a plan for your life. Even if you've messed it up to the max, God says, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is your help. I'm still here. I've still got a plan. And it ain't over till it's over. And God will have the last word. Just always remember, there's ruin and there's restoration, but which are you going to hold on to? Which are you going to focus on? We could just we could give you dozens and dozens of scriptures that point out the ruin and the restoration. We started with one, John 10.10. 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and to destroy. There's the ruin. But I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. There's the restoration. What about Romans 6.23? The wages of sin is death. There's the ruin. But the gift of God is eternal life. There's the restoration. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. There's the ruin. But then he said, but in me you have peace because I've overcome the world. There's the restoration. What are you going to allow to influence your life? And what are you going to take ownership of? I've given excuses in my life. And excuses never help anything. All they do is perpetuate the mess of humanity. But we get into the stage of no bull. Just get honest with God. Let Him influence you. Let Him influence you more than all the news reports, all the things that irritate, frustrate you. If you'll let God be the most influential person in your life, that's going to give you power to deal with every other situation and circumstance you have to deal with in life. Let me encourage you, don't take your problems to God, take God to your problems. Whole lot better way to live. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your people tonight. Thank you for your goodness and for your mercy toward us. Lord, we're just so thankful that, that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to be our Savior, to die on the cross for us. And Father, as believers here tonight, we are here to just declare that you are the Lord of our life. You are going to be more influential in our lives than anything that's ever happened to us. Anything that anyone's ever said about us, anything that bothers us, Lord, we declare your lordship over every area of our life. Reign, rule in our lives tonight. But Father, I know there are people here tonight that may have never made that decision, may have never accepted your lordship over their lives. And Father, I pray tonight that the Holy Spirit will speak to their hearts and convict them and convince them of how much they need you, how much they need a relationship with you, how much that, that life will never be fulfilling, life will never be satisfying until they get their hearts right with you. As the saint of old said, our hearts are restless, O oh God until we find our rest in you. Everybody go ahead, look at me. I want to talk to you for a minute. I was here preaching a few years ago on a Sunday morning. And Pastor Jim and Deborah, I don't know if you remember this, but you'd had a lady that was on a game show. What's the one where they say, come on down? What is that game show? Price is Right. 
Do you remember that lady that she won a car or something, I think? What's her name? Michelle. And I remember they showed the video clip. And all those folks, you know, being silly at that game show. And, and uh, they said, Michelle, come on down. And she just was excited. She ran down to the front. You know why she ran down to the front? Because she had a chance, a possibility of winning a car that was going to rust, that was going to need repairs, that was going to need upkeep. Hey, a car's great. I'm not down on a car. But I want you to know tonight, there's something a whole lot better available to you than a car. I want you to know tonight that Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, is alive right now, offering you the gift of forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. And if they can say on a silly game show, come on down. Hey, I think we ought to be more excited about coming down for the gift of eternal life than about some natural thing that's going to be worn out in a few years. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never given all of your life and all of your heart to Jesus Christ. Tonight is your night to do that. You, you may be here tonight thinking, why are these people so you know, happy and joyful and all that? It's because they have something in their life. They're not perfect. They're still learning. They're still growing. But I want you to know I, I, I was raised in a church and I thought that because I belonged to the church and because I tried to be a good person, I, I hoped that I would be okay for heaven. Can I tell you something? You're never good enough for heaven. You're never perfect enough for heaven. You're never religious enough for heaven. Heaven is for one type of person and one type of person only. Heaven is for people who are forgiven. And if you're here tonight and you've never accepted the love of God, I want you to know, I, and, and I just so appreciate people who've come into my life and told me the truth. And that's what this church stands for, telling you the truth. Jesus said you must be born again. He didn't say it's a good idea, it's a nice thing, it would be a good option. No, he said you must, it's an imperative. We have to have a new heart and that only comes from putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't come from trying harder. It doesn't come from trying to clean up your own act. It, it's a gift that God gives us when we give all of our life and all of our heart to Jesus Christ. In just a minute, we're going to invite you, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, we're going to invite you to come down so we can pray with you and believe God with you for a brand new beginning, a brand new start. If you've never given Jesus all of your life and all of your heart, I'm talking to you right now. Today is the day of salvation. If you've been running away from God instead of running to God and you know like the prodigal son that you need to come back to God and you need to get honest with God and you need to get squared away in your walk with God, tonight is your night. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to do three things. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If that's you, you need Jesus for the very first time. You need to rededicate your life to God. I'm going to ask you after that, several are going to do I'm going to ask you to stand up with everybody else. And I'm going to ask you to come right down front and pray. And people are going to get a new life tonight because of God's mercy and because of God's grace. If that's you on the count of three, I want to see your hand real high. One, two, three. Let me see your hand all over this place. Thank you. There's a hand. I'm looking all over this place. Thank you. There's a hand. Thank you. Right down front here. How many others are there? I'm looking all over this place. There's a hand way in the back. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's a fourth, fifth hand all over this place. Let's go ahead and stand up right now. If you raised your hand or should have raised your hand, I want you to slip out of where you're seated right now and make your way down front. We're going to pray with you. And I want you to turn to the person right beside you. And I want you to say to that person beside you, hey, if you need to go down there, I will walk down there with you. 
Turn to the person beside you and say that to them right now. They may just need a little nudge. They may just need a little encouragement. What is your name? Sean. And it's so good to see you. LaGertha, it's so good to see you. Hello. What's your name? Mark. Good to see you. Mark. Two Marks. All right. Step right on up here, guys. All right. Here comes some from over here. What's your name? Lynn. Lynn. So good to see you. God bless you. Is this your friend? Yeah. All right. What's your name? Mary. Mary. So good to see you. What's your name? Gina. So glad you've all come. Here comes some more from different parts of the auditorium. God bless you guys. What's your name? Jonathan. So good to see you. What's your name? So good to see you. And your name? Lisa. Lisa. So good to see you. Okay, we are going to pray right now. We're going to pray in just a quick minute here. And here are some more over here. God bless you guys. So glad you've come. God bless you, man. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. So good to see all you guys. Well, listen, there's one thing. You know this. I don't need to tell you this, but I just want to let you know I did not die on a cross for you. Jesus did. And uh, he's the reason you're here tonight. Because God loved you so much. I believe this with all my heart. That if you were the only person that had ever messed up in life. And you were the only person that needed love, mercy, forgiveness. I believe that Jesus would have done it just for you. There is nothing you've done that is greater than how much he loves you. And there's no mistake, no sin you've ever committed that's greater than the hope that he has for your future. As you give your life and your heart to him today, God is going to give you a brand new heart and a brand new life. We're going to pray. And I'm going to ask everybody in this whole place to pray this out loud. I'm going to ask you to pray. And I want this to come from your heart. Don't just say it because I'm saying it, but let it come from your heart. Just lift one hand up toward heaven. That just shows I'm reaching up to God. And say this with me. Say, Dear God, God, I come to you right now. I I thank you you that you love me so much much. that you sent Jesus Jesus. to die on the cross for me. me. I I believe that he shed his blood so that I could be forgiven. And I believe that He is alive today. He is offering me the gift of forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. Jesus, I receive You as my Lord and I receive every gift that You're giving me. And I give You all of my life all of my heart. I am turning my life over to you, to your Lordship. I thank you tonight for giving me a brand new life, a brand new beginning, and I thank you for helping me to live for your glory and your honor. I thank you that you've accepted me, that you love me, And God, I thank you that you are my Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Guys, everybody look right here. This handsome, smiling guy is Pastor Joel. And uh, if you'll just go with him, turn this way. They're going to give you some free stuff, a Bible, some things to help you in your walk with God. Go right this way. And let's give them one more hand as they go.